All right. Well, welcome back to Contenders here. We've got the FX section right here and very excited today. This is our biggest panel of all of the contenders. Uh, this is for the limited series, Mrs. America, and it is sensational. I can, I can tell you I watched it riveted through the whole thing and I learned a lot. Um, we have, let me just count them down here, Kate Blanchett, who plays Phyllis Schlafly. Hi, Kate. Uh, we uh, have Schlafly. <laughs> we have Rose Byrne, who plays Gloria Steinem. Uh, we have Uzu Aduba, who plays Shirley Chisholm. We have Tracy Ullman here, who plays Betty Friedan. We have Margot Martindale, who plays Bella Abzug. We have Sarah Paulson, who's playing a fictionalized character, kind of a combination of people, Alice here. <laughs> and we have Elizabeth Banks, who plays Jill Ruckelshaus. Hi guys. Um, Hi. All right, Kate, I, I have to ask you, I have to start with you because not only do you play Phyllis, you are also an executive producer of this. And, and this is your first big television project here. I got to ask why this appealed to you and why you wanted to take this on. Because a lot of people look at Phyllis and, and they don't look too kindly on her um, and others do, but it was an interesting character to play, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it was just an extension of what I'm in, always interested in as an actor. It's being part of something. So in a way, the the character that I ended up playing is kind of a secondary thing. But for me, it was, um, I, I, I think I was reeling like a lot of us from the 2016 election and trying to reverse engineer about how women could vote for the man who currently sits in the White House. And just, just to try and understand that and also to... It was a period of history that I thought I knew a lot about, second wave feminism, but I didn't know who Phyllis was. And I had no idea about um, how polarizing she was and really how she put a lot of things into what we understand the, uh, as being the Republican Party platform now. And I, I think I generally, apart from playing someone that felt so far away from me, um, I was interested in trying to understand what was so terrifying for people about the notion of equality. I found that a really uh, prescient and timely kind of thing to delve into. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating to see this character because it's mentioned in the series too. A lot of people looked at her and said, you know, she may be more of a feminist in some ways than the other characters in her own way because she was working in an all male driven world trying to break through. And that's something I never thought about with her at all. Yeah, I'm. I feel like I'm. I'm working in an all male world, trying to break through. To so, I don't know what's changed, but yes, I mean, yes, I mean, there was that was part of the. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I grew up in in the backlash to, to second wave feminism, where you know I I thought feminism was about equality, and uh, I I didn't realize I think until I started to do the deep research for Mrs. America that all of that negative um, baggage that came with calling oneself a feminist in the 80s, it, it came out yeah. of um, all of these sort of, just the strive for equality um, by fe feminists in the 70s. So that was a real, it was, it was a fascinating thing, I think, for all of us to see how much has changed, but also how little the language has changed. Yeah, it's fascinating. Now, Rose, you're playing Gloria Steinem. She's still with us, too. I don't know if you ever had the chance to actually meet her or anything. What was your approach to playing Gloria Steinem in this? I I didn't get to meet Gloria, unfortunately. I've never met her. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't know if I if it would have helped. It probably would have been very intimidating, I imagine. Um, but uh, I didn't really know where to start because there's so much so much on Gloria, obviously, her own writings and then all the historical archival sort of writings and articles and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, Darby Waller, the showrunner, she sent me a package to begin with because I was like, I don't know where to begin. And she sent me a package of, uh, you know, things to start to read, which was, um, which was really helpful because it is quite, it was quite overwhelming trying to figure out, trying to figure out where to begin. Wow. Um, the voice, you got that voice down. How difficult was that? And and how much work did you put into that to, to I, I feel like I'm watching Gloria Steinem when I'm watching your performance and it's not an impression, but it was very unique to her. Uh, oh, thanks. I um, I started working with Kate Wilson, uh, Kate Wilson, who is one of the lead vocals 
teachers at Juilliard and she was really helpful a couple of months early on, like before we started shooting. Uh, yeah, her voice was so, was so specific. I hadn't really heard her speaking that much, particularly back then um, from the period of when we're setting the show in the 70s. Um, so yeah, it was quite distinctive, but Kate was great because you obviously don't want to be thinking about the voice when you're doing it. You want to be able to be fluid in the scene and everything. So she was really uh, helpful in finding all the colors in there. But uh, yeah, it's definitely that very Midwestern Ohio kind of flat sounding, very specific sound. Yeah. Um, Tracy, you're playing Betty Friedan. Many people certainly know Betty Friedan. She was right out there at the beginning of the feminist movement. What kind of uh, things did you discover in playing Betty? Um, yeah, the same as Rose. I mean, there's so much you can research, you know, from public appearances they made. and uh, But it's finding out, knowing what they're like in private and how they were but, um, amongst each other and how they spoke to each other, you know, without pontificating or um but yes i i i, I uh loved being bet i had to fight really hard for this role i think i've mentioned that before it was you know to be, I, think I really want to be a part of this group of wonderful actresses and uh i used to try and draw on her betty betty is a quite extraordinary person i think she had a huge ego i love her voice talk about midwest she was midwest peoria uh and everyone thinks she's a new yorker no 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 and that is a uh, but there was a lot to research on her. And her book, The Feminine Mystique, she wrote the book. And although she was like that generational before all these ladies here, you know, she wrote that amazing book, couldn't take it away from her. It was brilliant. Yeah, Margot, I have to ask you too. Bella Abzug so, seems so bigger than life. You know, of course, the hats, the look, that accent too. But um, what about playing Bella Abzug? You played so many interesting characters in your career. Where does she fit in, uh, in terms of this? Well, I, you know, it was it was a huge responsibility, and I felt uh, overwhelmed by it. Uh, I started with a dialect coach at two months before Coley Calhoun, and uh, I watched m many, many, many videos. And it, and as Tracy said, it's very hard to find anything uh, where uh, you see who these people are in, in private. And that was sort of up to our imaginations. And uh, and I I love that part about it because uh, you could uh, find the vulnerability in that and um, and the relationship between Betty and Bella uh, was and Shir and Shirley and Gloria I mean it, these were we all were tight um, uh, they had a very close relationship a, a very close friendship. Uh, and and so did she and and Betty, you know. She they loved each other, and you know, she she couldn't help but love Betty, and just despise her at the same time. And then Shirley, of course, Margot Martindale loved Shirley so much. So, I mean, I I loved I uh, and Bella loved Shirley. She just Shirley just didn't follow the rules. Yeah, I have to say, you mentioned Shirley Chisholm, and of course, Luzo, you're, you're terrific as her, and I think a, you're introducing a lot of people to her. I know who she is. I have a wow. bumper sticker. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> Which I got at the uh, convention, that um, McGovern convention that you put in. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. And I can tell you uh, from watching this, when I watch that sequence there, I'm going like, oh, my God, they got this so right, because I was an alternate. And you author. never stuck it on your gremlin. Uh, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it had and, exploded. <laughs> you played her, and I never thought of her in this whole uh, world, uh, uh, you know, like some of the other characters here. That was a revelation to me. I knew her from when she ran in, in Congress and everything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I would say the same thing. I would agree. I never thought of her as part so intricately woven into the Women's Caucus um, and the Second Wave movement. But what Margo was just touching on, I think, is 100 percent, you know, um, the fact that all of these women were tethered to one another, that there were. I, th the, I think the thing that I was most excited about in doing this project is learning there was just so many women who were a part of this movement and advance and who had so many such powerful seats and voices and um, who, frankly, time had forgotten a lot of 
Um, and what an amazing thing that you get to see and hear these names, hear their, their stories, their individual stories today. And, and I think there's a host of women who know them, uh, who were maybe there like yourself, you know, in that time. But there is a, an entire generation of people who did not know all of their names. And I think it's just amazing that we get to hear their names. And I think it's amazing that there are people are getting to hear Betty Friedan's name and know her relevance in a larger way, getting to hear, you know, Bella Abzug's name and understand it in a larger way, hear Shirley Chisholm's name, understand it in a larger way and understand that the pillars on which we all stand, that there were a lot of legs and a lot of women in the trenches making that happen. And, and including on both sides, on both sides, you know, this was a movement on both sides of women. Yeah, when you talk about both sides, a lot of people are surprised, uh, you know, especially in today's polarized society, to see a Republican, uh, Jill Ruckelshaus, uh, who was very much uh, her husband in the Nixon administration and everything, very much a feminist, very much in this movement, Elizabeth. And that was that was another revelation from this series. I think, yeah, I, I agree. I, I didn't know about Jill Ruckel's house before I started this process. And I also got a great packet from Davi, the creator of the show. Um, to introduce me to her, I think my I think the best thing about her is that she reminds everyone that bipartisanship was so much a part of what these women were trying to do, that they were trying to be as inclusive as possible and you know uh, with limitations, of course, but but they tried. and um and I also thought it was important to re to remind people that politics was not always the way it is right now that we were not always as divisive, that there was more cooperation across the aisle, that there was always, you know, was, you, you never were gonna get everything that you wanted from the other side, but we had to have compromise in order to function uh, in the best way possible. I think clearly when you, when you have no cooperation, we don't function as well. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And Sarah, you're playing a fictionalized character, kind of a composite of, of women here uh, on the uh, other side here with Phyllis. And why was it important to have a character like this? Well, I mean, I, was, uh, I certainly think uh, you have an opportunity there to, um, to, to fictionalize this, the plight of, of a woman on the other side who feels largely unseen. Uh, in the context of the movement, and who who feels that you know everywhere she looks that the, the movement is um, a real threat to her, it's sort of threatening her her worldview, her comfort, where she feels the source of power, which is as a homemaker, and uh, and is very devoted to that, and feels very um, fulfilled by doing that. And, and there's there's a movement of, of women sort of suggesting that to feel that way is somehow a negative, and. Um, I don't know. I mean, I was absolutely jealous of all these women getting to, you know, play these iconic women and walking into the hair makeup trailer and seeing everyone's picture with the real life person. And then what what the extraordinary hair and makeup people on the show did with, with helping everybody achieve that look. And, and also, it's really fun to dive into all that research. And stuff. But it was ultimately had its had its bonuses too to to be able to, to do this other thing. Well, it's it's so fascinating. Kate, I do have to ask you too. This has been on, It's I suddenly am reading so much more about the ERA uh, amendment again that fell out, you know, and, and that people are now still trying to get that through. And it looks like the television project here can be a part of that, can in, in re-energizing the movement here. Uh, is that another appeal of, of being on television here and with something like this? Well, it's, it's, a very, it's a very complicated thing. I mean, throughout the course of development, um, there were so many strands of the story that people were saying, oh, look, this is an important part of the women's movement, like the, um, the reproductive freedom, um, and, but, but do we need a whole episode around it? And then, of course, the fetal heartbeat ruling was, was, was passed. And you think as, as each week went by, it just became increasingly relevant. And in post-production, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the ERA, but of course it's way past the ratification deadline. And I think it's been made clear from the White House that it's not going back on the agenda anytime soon. But it is bizarre um, to me that in a, in a democracy that, you know, that prides itself on, on so many wonderful things that, that equality isn't enshrined as a fundamental tenant in, the, in that um, 
in that document um, because it seems to be something that, that is foundational in Americans' understanding of themselves. You can only wonder what, how things might have been handled differently if equality was a fundamental tenant in American democracy. It might be different. So, But, I, yeah, it's been playing on my mind a lot, certainly a lot. Well, we can only hope, and I hope everybody uh, gets a chance to see Mrs. America. And if I had one more square here, we could play Hollywood Squares. But we <laughs>